Welcome back, folks, to the WP Tonic Roundtable Show. This is episode 519. We're recording this on August the 7th, 2020, at 8.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. You can join us and watch us live on the WP Tonic Facebook page. I've got a small panel, but a powerful panel, or a medium size. I would say it's a medium size panel. I'm going to let them quickly introduce themselves, and then we're going to go straight into the stories of the week. I've got my friend John Locke. Oh, he's, 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 he's going. All right, John, would you like to quickly introduce yourself? Yeah, John Locke. Um, I do SEO for manufacturing firms. That's great. And I've got my uncle, Uncle Spencer. <laughs> Spencer, would you like to? You, you can just call him Tiberius. Tiberius. His sister and I are very happy these days. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Spencer Foreman from LaunchFlows.com. I've got my friend Sally with us. Sally, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, certainly, I'm Sally Getch, the WP developer on the verge of a nervous breakdown. All right, there, that's great. <laughs> Sorry, join the rest of us. Uh, I've got uh, yes. Stephen, uh, <laughs> St Stephen uh, I've got our young Stephen with us. Would you like to quickly introduce yourself? Yeah, Stephen Satter from zipfish.io. I was asked by somebody um, who, who listens to this show what, what its purpose was. And I said, it has no purpose, only to entertain. I said, uh, entertain me and hopefully entertain the people that um, actually um, listen or view it. Um, but we do try and um, spread some light on the WordPress community and what's going on and the slightly bigger tech world that WordPress is a part of. And I think we do a reasonable good job of it. I, I think it's a unique um, round table. You won't get this anywhere else. I don't know if that's good or bad though, uh, uh, but it's unique. Um, so let's, before we go that's into- That's right. When they made this podcast, they broke the mold. Yeah, exactly. But before we go into our main stories, I've got to mention my major sponsor because they really help with the costs. And yes, listeners and viewers, it does cost money to run a podcast. Um, basically, that's Kinster. Kinster have been uh, my major sponsor for almost three years now. They've been a great partner and they've got a great product. They only host WordPress websites. Um, they've built the business from a small hosting company into one of the leading WordPress hosting companies. Um, and um, they're just great for you and your clients. You, they, they build their hosting on Google technology. You get blindingly fast websites. Um, you get all the bells and whistles and you get a fantastic UX design interface for you and for your clients. And their support is fantastic as well. So just go over there and choose one of their plans for yourself or for one of your clients. And the main thing is to tell them that you heard about them on the WP Tonic show. On to the stories. And number one, WordCamp US 2020 cancelled due to the pandemic. Stress and on an online event fatigue. I like that last bit, online event fatigue. What did you think of that one, um, Spencer? It's interesting about the fatigue part because I can definitely say that I had offline event fatigue before. So I'm not sure whether the online was more or less, but I was, for example, for maybe four years in a row, trying to get to the Chicago WordCamp, which is always here in the nearby DePaul area. It's about it's five, minutes, far away. five minutes from your house, but you're just going to be- It was five minutes from where my office is. Yeah. And they always seem to make it just annoying enough or aggravating enough or inconvenient enough that over the four or five years I tried, I never made it to a single one of these, even in my backyard. So last year I was saying I was going to make it to the German one. I never did. I can never make it to these things. And I miss all the good stuff, like all the Yoast misogynistic parties. I miss all of the- <laughs> You know the blackface. Uh, That's what I want. I want to go. I want to go to. I, mean, the, I want to so, go to one of the German ones and meet I, those yo skills. Yeah. Yeah, right. I was really looking forward to the online events filling in the gap where I can, you know, see the orgies remotely, see people being defaced for good work, and you know, embarrassed to go back. You know, now now I get to lose out on all that. So. I don't. I really don't know what to say. I, I apologise, listeners of yours. By English humour, sometimes isn't taken as humour. But there we go. Um, Sally, what did well, you? Think I, I mean, I was kind of surprised uh, when they cancelled WordCamp US because they'd 
gone so far down the, the, the path of it. Um, uh -huh. uh, but uh, I think some of it is, is event fatigue and some of it is um, sponsor shortages uh, that, because uh, I, I know uh, all the global uh, sponsors uh, for WordPress events have basically backed off until we're allowed to have events in person. And, you know, one of my meetup sponsors is not sponsoring us right now since they mostly paid for the food we ordered when meeting in person. It, you know, it doesn't make too big a, a difference to us. Uh, but I think what happened is that they, you know, they had WordCamp <coughs> Europe virtually and they made it free and they lost money on it uh, oh, well. and so and they're kind of thinking well the thing about the online stuff is that then every event really is competing with every other event and you know every single weekend there's a word camp somewhere uh, or uh, normally <clears throat> and it it does get to the point where i think in the in the beginning people were kind of excited about the opportunity to go places that they didn't usually you know visit places they didn't usually get to visit we had some visitors come to our meetup even from uh, even from europe that was pretty cool but after a while everybody's like damn it i am on this stupid zoom thing you know all day every day uh, and i am you know just tired of this and there are a bunch of things that it's very hard to do at an online event and sometimes those are the things people really want to go to the word camps for uh and uh you know you you may not uh, uh, <clears throat> uh be going for the uh, you know for the orgies and inappropriate behavior um which i personally have not witnessed um but mainly uh <clears throat> you know i went to uh, word camp san francisco when it was a thing and um word camp sacramento uh, which made efforts to be family friendly in its various events, um, at least the ones I got invited to. Uh, so, yeah, I kind of I see where you're coming from, but yeah, I mean, uh, I, it's uh, it's disappointing. But I, you know, I know some of the people who were organizing it, and and that was not an easy decision for them to make. No, but I've, I still think I wouldn't say it's embarrassing, but I I. I I think that's overdoing it a bit, but I was surprised. I thought myself, it is Word WordCamp, you know, WordPress US, you know, for you know, and I thought their online um, system on the previous couple couple wasn't that fantastic. I thought it was a golden opportunity to actually put money and really try and build up the online um, presentation of it. Um, right. I mean, US is the one where you get more people watching the live stream, at, at least for the state of the word, which they're talking about maybe doing as a, you know, a, a separate standalone thing. Um, you know, it's, it's supposed to be the unique event in the WordPress Canada for the year, isn't it? What did you reckon, Stephen? Um, I think, you know, kudos to them for canceling it this far out in advance. I feel like if there's one more event that I'm like planning on or getting excited about and then it gets canceled, like, you know, a couple months before, like it just happens over and over again. People reschedule something and they have to cancel the reschedule and they can reschedule it later. And to me, like, that's the fatigue that I'm, that I'm really tired about of is <clears throat> getting my hopes built up and then having them dashed. And so I think it is... Nice well, to be proactive about it. Well, yes, Steve. although it is only a couple of months in advance by now, because that event is in October, and it's, surprise, August. Yeah, but Steve, when you get to my age, you get used to disappointments. <laughs> right, uh, um, uh, um, uh, John, what do you reckon? Yeah, I, I think what I'm hearing is the people who uh, go to WordCamps to be energized by the energy uh, that you get from... Uh, hanging out with your friends face to face, I think that's a big disappointment for them. Um, I mean, I guess a lot of people hang out on Zoom all day or, or go to different things on Zoom. I, I myself don't do that. So, I, well, but, I think it's a lot of the people who used to work in offices. Oh, I got gotcha. you. There you go. 
So, oh, yeah. but, you know, but did they get sponsorship money for this? I mean, where, where is that going? Is that going back to the, uh, sponsors? I think, I think mostly this, I mean, I don't know how much sponsorship money they had already collected. Mm -hmm. Um, but I know if a word campus is canceled, any remaining sponsorship money goes back to the sponsors. But the sponsors have just pretty much completely pulled back from sponsoring any of the, the events. And the events were really only possible because of the sponsorship, sponsors. because the, you know, 20 bucks or 50 bucks or whatever you pay really yeah. does not cover the, the yeah. cost of having yeah. the event. Mm, yeah, you can see, you know, I think, but, uh, but on, a, on, on a certain level, I think. I think things will go back to a certain extent, but I think even if there's a vaccine and effective vaccine, then we can see to some extent the back of this terrible pandemic. I still think things will have changed in a major way as well. So I don't ever see it going back to what it was before this pandemic, but we are, we will we will find out in the uh, has, when time passes. So on to the next story. Page views is a bonus bill, billing metric for WordPress host and, and page speed. What we learnt by and an, oh page and then I got another got another story page speed that we've learnt by analysing one point five thousand agency websites. Yeah. So um, I think story one you found, Spencer. So what did you like about page views is a bogus billing metric. Yeah. So Josh, Josh <laughs> Strebel from uh, Pagely wrote this. And, you know, Pagely came out around the same time as WP Engine, which was... Pagely was first. It might pa have been Pagely was the first... The, it was the, the first managed company. Right. And anyway... WP Engine, and it's not telling anybody things they don't know, is essentially was an idea that was cooked up to take the wealth of available rack servers and co-located servers and so forth, shared servers, and repurpose them by caching and varnishing the crap out of them. And in order to manage that whole relationship, um, the team over there decided that what they were going to end up doing was to put a metric on it, which was similar to when you had text messaging that they used to charge you per text message and stuff. It was a false metric. It always was, but essentially to limit people's abuse of like, there's 50 kids in the school bus. Hey kids, you can't take too many of the seats. You know, you got to sit in your seat. They cached and varnished it and limited people on page views. But if you think about it, there is nothing dumber than that when you're running a business and they're saying, we're here to support your growth and success. But if you start being too successful, you're just going to end up being crushed by the limits of the cost on this. When it's a false cost, because it really doesn't cost them anything to give you more page views. It was just, anyway, so Josh is finally 10 years ago calling this out because ironically, they still use the same metric at WP Engine today. And I'm not picking on them particularly because there's other companies do it, but they're the worst violator, in my opinion, of common sense because we have all dynamic websites today, right? It could be membership, could be marketing automation, especially it's e-commerce through WooCommerce. And with WP Engine by default, caching and varnishing the crap out of your stuff, they're just taking a bunch of Polaroid pictures of your pages. Stephen can talk to this more when everybody is trying to just change things every second on the fly. So you end up with having a Sophie's choice. I have to call them up and specifically beg them to remove all of the things that are screwing on my website while at the same time paying them for page views on a site that if I just go on to another thing like can start CloudRaise or something, well, whatever, I wouldn't have had that problem in the beginning. So that's, that's why this whole thing is ridiculous and he's calling it out. Uh, ultimately a little too late, but still good to hear. Oh, well, it's not like it's the first time uh, Josh Treble has, you know, made a dig at WP Engine. Um, uh, here's, a, here's, the thing, here's the thing about metrics is that everybody's metrics are complete garbage because like, for instance, you go to Pagely, what, what metrics do they give you? Well, they have, they give you two CPUs and two gigabytes of RAM like on their basic plan that costs 200 bucks a month. But like, I have two CPUs downstairs and some gigabyte RAM sticks that couldn't even boot Windows you know, 10 today, let alone run any sort of website. Like, technology has changed so much in what RAM can do and what a CPU can do that the only real way to know 
how your website is going to perform. It's like, look at detailed like metrics of like, what exactly is the clock speed? How much data can this, you know, outpush and how many, how many calculations can it do? And, um, but nobody wants to take the time and, and, to do and that research and figure it out. And how does that actually compare to the real world? Uh, right, you know, right. The... And, and so everybody's metric, whether you have page views or say you have two gigabytes of RAM is, is like meaningless because it's all so subjective. Um, most companies that I've seen that have page views those don't even really hold to those page views. Some, some do calculate it, but a lot just are like, you know what, if you go over, we don't care but they have it there so that those that use tons of CPU power, they can go back and point to the people like, hey, you have too many page views. And that's a metric that any business owner can understand. And they can yeah. say, you need to upgrade your system. Whereas if you talk to a business owner and say, hey, you're running out of RAM, they're like, well, what does that mean? How do I fix that? What's like, I don't understand. I think that. you're so spot on, Stephen. You know, of course, if, if you're using, and I, I, I I think we've only got one client on WP Engine, uh, which is, surprises me in a way, but the others are on, on all sorts of different hosting companies, but, um, um, or we're hosting it for them. Um, but um, I think you, you're spot on because um, I think a lot of the reasonable hosting companies, they, they're not, they're not going to hammer you. I do know some of the, there are some that will, um, but I also think you're spot on because it, it, you're just using it as a kind of guide that the business user can fundamentally have some understanding. Because, like what you said, if you say CPUs and RAM, what do they? It doesn't, it doesn't mean anything to them anyway. So you kind of, you kind yeah. of. Which is why I was kind of surprised that he wrote this article trying to blast page views when, I'm, like, you go to their site and it's just like, well, like you're. Your stats are, kind of, are, are just as pointless, like in a different direction, but like probably one that's even a little bit less tangible for me to understand. Like it's harder for me to understand exactly what your CPUs can do and what your RAM can do than page views. Like I can, I can quantify that metric very easily. Um, and like, yes, I, at the I end of the day- I suppose the idea is, is just that you can assume that more is better. Uh, but yeah, because, because you know, uh, most of us are not running web servers. I mean, you know, I know what my uh, RAM and my CPU will get me on my Windows machine. And that's like completely different from what yeah. is involved in, in, in running a server. There's only three, there's only three things people really care about, right? Like one, does my website load fast? Two, is it reliable? And three, is there somebody that I can talk to if, some, if I have a problem? Right. And that's like, like that, that's what, why we created Zipfish is because like, who cares if you have 10 CPUs or one CPU, as long as your site loads, you know, in under one second, like, is that possible? Well, if it is, then who cares what the page view count is or who cares what the actual hardware behind it is, as long as it's fast, reliable, and you have great support. Um, and everybody kind of gets in these weeds where it's like, here, we'll give you two CPUs. But the only other people who care about it are other people that are server nerds who like, already know how to spin up their own boxes and install their own software right. on top of everything. Yeah. I mean, it, I think it comes back to a, a lot of what we've heard Spencer say about, you know, hosting as a commodity, you know, more or less like t toilet paper and attempting to differentiate it in some way uh, is extremely difficult. Uh, and so, uh, you know, you get all these, these, uh, <clears throat> made up things and uh you know what what got me and i i you know because they own uh, uh, studio press now i talk to various of the people at wp engine who are involved on that side of it uh, and they're you know they're they're great people but uh you know when, when i went to the wp engine website and it's a digital experience platform it's like good lord what's that when it's at home and I don't think most people are out there searching for digital experiences. They're looking for hosting. That's a bit I want to add two quick things. First of all, Stephen's spot on about something, which is when you look at other services we use, let's say if you use Dropbox or Zoom, uh, I, from personal experience, I know that Dropbox does not actually limit you if you push their limits. Uh, and especially if you put stuff on Dropbox, shh, don't tell the kids but they never delete your stuff even if you stop paying. They'll bug you about it. They're like, but it's too expensive for them to go in and futz around with people's stuff and it's too risky for them. So they just leave your stuff there forever. Uh, the second is Zoom. 
I do a lot of recordings. Every conversation I have records by default. So I think it's like set to one gigabyte or something of storage normally. I get daily messages. Spence, you have 999 gigabytes of storage. Please go and delete something. And I have it set to auto delete. But the point is, Zoom will not delete you either, even though you're 100 times over the limit that they say. And I think it's for what Steven says. But the most important point I want to bring up is Steven's fabulous depth of field, because he's clearly using mirrorless DSLR camera for a mm. webcam. <laughs> it does look knows. very nice. But like, he looks amazing. The only thing is he's slightly lagging on the audio and I'm thinking his capture card is not keeping up. But man, you look good today, Stephen. What oh, have you got you. there? What are you using? Uh, yeah, so I got a 60 Mark II. Uh, it's something that we use for like just random photo taking, but I've been working on trying to set it up as a kind of system for webcam stuff. You look like- but Good to know the audio is late. I'm gonna have to look into that more. You're, you're, you, you need to speed up your uh, audio capture because you're about a half a second out of la uh, lagging on the audio sync though. So John, okay. what, did you, what did you reckon, John? Yeah, I mean, there's some good points here. I mean, but this is just a, um, I mean, this is just a way to kind of take a dig at competitors and it's, it's yeah. smart marketing. I mean, it's, um, it's basically saying, here's how we're different. Even though, I mean, a lot of the, the normal hosts just resell Google Cloud unless they have their own data centers. Um, for example, WP Engine and Kinsta both resell um, and Flywheel, uh, which is WP Engine. Uh, they all resell Google Cloud. And, uh, you know, uh, Josh, he resells um, Amazon AWS. And uh, some of the, some of the uh, the hosting companies have their own data centers like Kinsta and uh, uh, SiteGround. But I mean, it's all really kind of similar. I mean, the, it's like Steven said, all you really want to do is make sure that your page loads fast. Um, yeah, there are some good points in this article. I mean, some of the things that he's saying about page views are, are, are totally true. But I mean, it, it, the biggest things that hosting is, is, is this going to have a lot of problems my site loads fast do i have support when i need it you know it, the support and and the speed being the two biggest things yes so. for these critical websites we know all about that don't we john yes we do we all uh, our, um, <laughs> god uh, we're gonna go for our break listeners and viewers we'll be back in a few moments we're coming back we've had a good chat some good stories. Before we go into the others, I want to mention my other sponsor, WP Fusion. Great company, great product. Now, if you have got an external CRM system like Active Campaign, Drip, there's a load of them on the market, um, and you really want to link your WordPress with your SaaS based CRM, you need WP Fusion. It will put make the whole experience a lot more easier to set up. You'll get a lot more data and you'll be able to use your CRM to its full potential by using WP Fusion. I could go on. They've been a great part of the show, great supporter of the show. So go over to WP Fusion, have a look at their packages and what it can do for you and for your clients. You're going to be blown away. Go and buy one, but also tell them that you heard about them on the WP Tonic show. So on to the next story. So automatic updates press page to clarify the d division between WordPress org and WordPress.com. I think they, what did, what did you re reckon about this, John? I think they need more than, than a press clarification. Don't yeah, you? I mean, this is about 14 years too late. I mean, honestly, if they had wanted to differentiate it, they could have named it the, the hosted solution something else from the start. Uh, it's always been intentional. Now, I do appreciate what Casper uh, is, is doing in trying to um, clarify because in the press, um, you know, there's really no differentiation between the open source project and the hosted platform. Uh, and that's by design. But about halfway through this article, it really started to feel like propaganda, uh, where, um, and mind you, WP Tavern, 
is owned by Aubrey Capital, which is an automatic thing. Automatic, uh, for all intensive purposes, owns WP Tavern and their employees of Matt Mullenweg. Um, but about halfway through this, it was saying that, uh, where is it here? It's saying, oh, uh, you know, yeah, it's automatic, does not own um, or run the open source project. And I think everybody in the community knows that's false. That, you know, the community tried very uh, hard to put a governance project in place. Our own friend Morton and Rachel Cherry tried to put that governance project in place and it was shot down uh, by Automatic and Matt Mullenweg. So, I mean, we all know that Automatic decides the direction of the open source project because that feeds into the for-profit uh, project, which is WordPress.com. They're intertwined. Uh, so th that's the only uh, thing to, to, to keep in mind. They are two separate things, but you know, if the community uh, at large tried to decide the direction of the project, uh, they would be vetoed by automatic. What do, you, what do you reckon about this, Stephen? Oh, you boot, Stephen. Oh, yeah. I, mean, I mean, it's like it's a confusion that's has been there since day one. When I got into WordPress, it took me probably a year to sort out exactly what <laughs> WordPress.com was versus WordPress.org. Um, so, I mean, it's something that like is there and has been there, and it's good that there's like clarification that's happening. But um, I'm right on board with John. Like, it's it's a little late to try to make that clarification. And even though if you make that clarification as clear as possible, somebody outside of the community does not understand if you put wordpress.com or wordpress as just a standalone word, like they don't understand the, the difference or the subtle difference that's actually a huge difference behind those two. Um, yeah, it's not very subtle if you uh, logged into wordpress.com recently. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. And something that was interesting is if you read in the comments on that article, somebody talked about like the New York Times, Times article about saying that wordpress.com like has 37% of the internet. Um, they're saying, well, I mean, they, they kind of do because WordPress.com is controlling the WordPress open source community. Like they have their hands so deep into that. Like even though you can say technically it's not, but in some very real sense, it is. They, they control what's happening to the open source. They have the most developers contributing stuff. If they want to go whatever direction they want to go, that's probably the way it's going to go. Um, and hopefully like someday that changes, but I don't think a press release where you are saying, you know, here's how to put out our brand actually changes the underlying problem behind any of it. Uh, yes. Well, and, and what I was wondering um, and didn't have a chance to check for was, you know, is there a comparable sort of statement anywhere on the WordPress.org uh, website? Um, and, mm -hmm. it, you know, I mean, WordPress.com was not a thing when I started using uh, WordPress. Uh, so, uh, it's never been a it's never been a problem uh, for me, but I notice in this uh, upcoming article we're talking about with Duda that that what the uh, comparison article is about is the WordPress.com hosted service. Uh, yeah, it was kind of because we interviewed Bridget Willard a few weeks ago on my first interview show, and she was quite um, forthcoming about her views. She said that Matt should resign as CEO of automatic and he should be offered a, a lifetime um presence um chairman or president of the wordpress foundation as and both the org and the com should have a separate ceo um and i agree with her totally what what, what do you reckon spencer I'm a little disappointed with Sarah Gooding, not that she has any choice in it, but I always felt like she was really doing a great job for years and years. I followed her stuff. This kind of article is pure propaganda. And as we've said, if you look at the Aubrey Capital details and scroll down to the last comment, of course, where you get all the gory details, but you know, it just, it's a little sad to me at this stage that they're perpetuating the same kind of Bullshit. Like whack-a-mole game of, look, Matt's the owner of the tavern, and look, it's wordpressorg.com, and look, oh, she is also the, the top-notch reporter for Aubrey Capital. It's like, just get on with it. Nobody's, nobody's confused, like, at the level of 
where we're at. Why, why do you think they attempt this? Because I don't even... Is it just for those that just don't know? I, I will tell you why. Yeah, go on. Okay, free labor. Everybody that has invo been involved with WordPress for years that's resentful of this kind of stuff is because they've put so much time into this open source project and being part of this community that they thought that their time and effort and efforts of building this up and promoting it uh, would mean something as far as having a voice in the direction of it. And then they sadly found out that it didn't. And this five to the five for the future thing where all these, you know, the, the major like WordPress agencies that are known in the space, they're paying their employees to basically build a product for WordPress.com. That's essentially what is going on. Yeah, I suppose you know, very simple. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, you're I mean, right. but I, I stay in it for the reasons that. Um, hey, man, it's it's a it's a it's a great way to build a website, and that's it. I I mean, and I love our gang, and I love certain people in the WordPress community, and uh, there's certain people that I don't like. So, but yeah, you know, I'm um, not, I'm not confused about it. But I think also the other reason that Spencer pointed out is the core fact it's open source and that can never be changed. So you you just got to tolerate this kind of... But I suppose you are right. For those that haven't been around, it enables the delusion and it gets more people to um, do free work for automatic, basically. I'd, I'd what do you reckon, Sally? Well, I think with the... Um you know, with the agencies uh, putting in time to uh, to work on this, I think that kind of falls under the enlightened self-interest. Yeah, that's uh, true. Because the agencies are making money uh, from yeah. WordPress and some of what yeah. they're contributing is stuff that's, you know, specifically useful for them anyway. And... Uh, you know, I think even, can, it, it, I, you know, I put I put a chunk of unpaid time into being a, a meetup yeah. organizer, but you know, indirectly, yeah. uh, that has brought me, uh, you know, brought me business. And, and I think as a developer, I think if you keep a balance to it, I think as a developer, you can increase your exposure quite a bit by doing, um, contributing. To yeah, project. I mean, you have to you you have to figure out what is it that you can actually afford to do and it's, it's yeah. not as if uh, wordpress or even open source is unique in this reliance on volunteers True. Uh, True. and the occasional uh, you know really heavy uh, uh, demands uh, I, never, I think I'm, people with kids especially run into uh, issues of being expected to to put in a lot of of unpaid service time in you know whether it's the pta or or the a little league or or the whatever mm. what do you reckon Stephen? i don't know it's it's one of those things where it just feels like a catch-22 no matter how you slice yeah. or dice it um something that spencer talks about sometimes uh is the rise of these other like large scale plugins or we, we all talk about it like you have these hosting companies that are becoming really huge you have these plugin companies like elementor and stuff they're becoming really big you have theme developers like um astra that's becoming really big and something that i've noticed is there's smaller plugin and theme developers are kind of frustrated about that at times because you have to put out a much better product product and you have to like live up to these high standards that have people have, you know, have 50, 100 developers working on something. But um, at the end of the day, th I think that's what the community needs is it needs somebody to rise to the size or close or a couple people to the size that is what automatic is so that th the community can start getting some of its autonomy back. And so a plugin developer like Elementor, what they decide to do it's starting to have a big impact on the WordPress community. Uh, what a theme like Astra is starting to do has a big impact. And uh, you can go down the list, right? Or WP yeah. Engine, um, all, all these guys. And as those, those guys become bigger, Automatic has to become smaller. I think, uh, that's a, I think that's a fantastic point there. Thanks for that. You've, uh, you, yes, I, I don't know that they become smaller in a literal sense, but they become, they take up less of the pie. Yes. Yeah, like the percentage, like ownership or the percentage that their opinion matters becomes less. 
you know, yeah, I think you've kind of, because, you know, when you're just all just like two, three plug-in shops and that, you know, old Matt, but when you're dealing with the power of Alamate or WP Engine or some of the other players, he, he has this, <laughs> I don't know how to put it in words, really, actually, but it's irritating. Um, what do you reckon, Spencer? I mean, I already commented on it, but I can say it again. <laughs> I mean, about the Matt Mullenweg stuff, I mean this. Did I miss the point? No, let's go on to the next story then. I, right. I, I said my piece on this subject. Yes, right, let's go on the next one. Um, USA uh, ad economy outpaces GDP during Q2 and first. We won't be that difficult. <laughs> Well, yes. I mean, the GDP is, is terrible, but, um, you know, loss of uh, ad revenue was certainly a, something people have been, you know, concerned about in the, yeah. in the pandemic because for certain types of, of companies, there's not much point advertising if your business isn't allowed to be open. Uh, and so, uh, uh, you know, what they're, I, this just kind of caught my, my eye that, you know, advertising... Uh, uh, his spend is is still much healthier than the economy yeah. in general. I didn't drill into. I don't know if they provided any kind of breakdown, but what occurred to me, and I might be totally wrong here, normally I am, is that also like on the digital side, which it's so dominated by Facebook and Google and their major their major advertisers. I don't know what kind of contract they are. You know, they're probably the kind of ad spend that we're probably talking about each contract is individually negotiated or I don't even know that because when you're dealing you know when you're dealing with such enormous companies like Facebook and Google you you might be a major advertiser but to them you're still nothing I, I, I just well don't yes it, it, it doesn't talk about Facebook's uh, attitude but it does mention that um you know, the small and medium-sized businesses that <clears throat> compose much of its uh, advertising base are uh, actually uh, performing well in terms of, of ad demand. And it seems like the the percentage, it says, you know, their top 100 advertisers are a smaller percentage of the total revenue than they, than they were last year. Um, but I suppose if, you know, you are one of those businesses that uh, either started up because of the pandemic or successfully pivoted into... Uh, uh, you know, selling something that that's in high demand. Uh, uh, I mean, apparently, uh, you know, all those fireworks that, that uh, uh, annoy the heck out of people. Uh, my husband was seeing fireworks ad ad advertised on Facebook, so uh, you know, those people, I, I, I guess, did fairly well out of it. And uh, you know, if you started selling uh, masks or toilet paper or or whatever, uh, 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 you know, Facebook is a a good place to start advertising if you don't have a big budget. To begin with, well, Facebook advertising has its own its own metrics, and you you got to do a bit of studying, and you got to you got to do a bit of practical, um, actually doing some campaigns and learning a little bit from your failures. Because in some ways, it, it's a very unique platform, and there's about three parts to it that you've got to get each part right. Um, and if you get either part wrong, your adverts just basically don't go anywhere. But if you get each part right, um, you you get, um, by my experience, you get some fabulous results. But yeah, um, it's a bit different than Google and some other advertising platforms because there's about three to four different parts that you've got to get right. What do you reckon about this, Spencer? Me? Yes, you, Spencer. Yeah. I mean, the thing that's interesting to me is that it's really hard when you're in the middle of a pandemic to judge what anything means. It yeah. would really be ironic to rely upon evidence during the statistics of Q1 to Q2 when that's when the whole United States economy went berserk in various ways. So this is one of those things like in the past when I used to have some interest in the stock market, and I really haven't for some time, you can manipulate the views of what's happening by zooming in or zooming out on a particular chart, whether it be the S&P or the Dow or even an individual stock. And you can say what you want about the trend when you zoom into a particular range close enough, because look, the line is trending up or trending down. And then you zoom out and you see, you know, the whole thing's going this way. There's just a little blip in that micro. So 
uh, this story by itself doesn't. Re- I don't know how it made it into the show. <laughs> <laughs> but I got it, I got it from Sally. Yeah, Sally was- no, I, I spotted it and I thought it was interesting that, you know, that, that there was a, a, a difference, a, a, a noticeable difference between, you know, the, the economy as a whole and the, uh, and the ad spend. Um, but, you know, yeah, it, to, to know what it means over time uh, it is different because the time hasn't elapsed. I, 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 I have an anecdote. Sorry to interrupt, but I have an anecdote, which is, again, I'm not a sports fan. I like to play sports, but I'm not a fan that sits around watching sports. But so we got the NBA, the Major League Baseball, NFL, and so forth doing their ver- various things. Interestingly enough, with baseball, there used to be a thing with the Cubs and other uh, baseball clubs called 50-50. When you went to the stadium, you could buy for 20 bucks, 40 numbers or something, and there would be all the people would essentially be part of a, a mini lottery. So maybe in an average game with the Cubs, there'd be a pot of 13, 14, 15,000 bucks for the w- winner whose number got picked. And I don't know how the government allows this to happen because it literally is just, it is gambling. There's no question about it. Now that they're doing the games via TV, they apparently opened up the ability for people to call in with a credit card and buy your tickets. Which means that at the last game, I don't know if it was a Cubs game or an Astros or something, but the point was the pot was five million bucks for a twenty dollar buy for something. Now your odds are whatever they are because the people around the country and in Canada were buying. But my point is, is that we're in a completely different world of what is the way that people and companies will make money relating this to advertisement. In the past, you could not have even talked about the notion of having a TV show where people called in, gave money from around the country, and they handed out five million bucks on the spot to somebody. But that actually is happening here. So I'm the baseball club owners, and I'm being total jackasses with the way I'm handling the pandemic versus, let's say, the basketball that's in a bubble and the hockey that's in a bubble. My guys are out gambling and you know doing crazy stuff and spreading the disease. But nevertheless, oh my God, every game, I'm getting 5 million bucks of revenue from allowing them to do a, a lottery. Well, advertisement is now out the window. I mean, if you think about it, like why do I need to bother taking money from a beer company when I can just let the people on TV see the game for free, send in 20 bucks, and the entire sport now goes from pay-per-view to free because everybody's going to send $20 in every game. You see what I'm saying? Like yeah. the, the entire model – is going to be revolutionized by what's happening. So instead of worrying about first to second, third quarter this year, I would say what's interesting is look at how everybody's behavior is going to change across sports and restaurants and movie theaters and, you know, behavior in schools. Cause well, you the saw opportunities the- are. Yes, wait, you, yes. One, one thing you have to understand for perspective though, Spence is, is that, um, you know, in Britain, everybody bets on everything all the time. <laughs> yeah. Right. I never do, but that true. was that would have never happened here. You know, uh well, I think, poker I think and stuff. They I think took you're, all those people to court. They put them in jail. And yeah, but for what? I think, I think you're because in, Americans are Puritans. Yeah. I think your insight there, Spencer, is really um you know, really great, you know, because in some ways we've seen that in politics, haven't we, Spencer? You know, Bernie Saunders and other candidates. You know, normally politicians, they have to get big sponsors, you know, big backers. But we've seen with um, a number of politicians on the right and on the left, um, I think That's mostly true. on the left, really, at the present moment, that they, they, um, they've been able to um, generate quite large amounts of money from small donorships, haven't they, online, haven't they? I mean, everything has changed because the rules, even when you talk about AI, um, uh, this is like really stretching out, but just to give an example, the technology exists now, like I said a couple of shows ago, for you to have a completely digitized voice of a person, right? Like I happen to have my voice digitized, hopefully, I don't know, in some place I'll get control of it. But with video the same way with that, you know, the, the ability to replace the face of an existing actor with the one that's not around anymore and so forth. My point is, is that all of those things that we've taken for granted to date as being involatile. I mean, you can't just do anything about it. Well, 
they're really kind of volatile now. You know, the actors can be replaced with AI. The person you're talking to on the phone literally could be a computer that is more efficient at customer support because it has 10 million rules and it can talk to you just like a person. So now you don't feel weird as you currently do with a bot. If you've got the ability to, do you remember there's a movie in the 70s called Rollerball with yes. James Caan? Well, it's, everybody, John, it's Jonathan. It's Jonathan. Yeah. And yeah. they would kill each other for sport on the TV and stuff. But I'm saying we're entering in that place where even professional sports, which have always been the way it's going to be, are going to be weird now. You know, no audience in the stands, people betting over the TV and, you know. So yeah, just expect Brent, the unexpected. Yeah. Is the, I'm just, the that's what I'm waiting for. Rollerball in America. Oh. Love that movie. Great Love movie. that movie. Love that. Of course, the heroes, Jonathan. So, uh, so um, Let's go on to number five. Let's try and squeeze number five in before we go to our recommendation. This is um, Doodal versus WordPress.com. Um, keep seeing their adverts or every time I, I um, it's either Wix or it's Doodal that I'm seeing. Every time I want to look at a WordPress um, training video. Um, so, Sally, do you know anything about Doodal? If you, if you, you know, it? I remember seeing it mentioned. I think I'd read one of these sort of Duda versus WordPress articles or seen one of their ads and thought, like, what's that? Because I, you know, hadn't heard of it prior to, to that. I don't really know anything about it. I mean, I'm not going to pay a whole lot of attention to the comparison that's on their own website because, you know, uh, yeah, you, I love, you know I love, they're going to highlight the places. I love the where... tick. I love that. I thought myself, who, who wrote this? And it's, it's pretty pricey, isn't it? I, lo- I, like the uh, I didn't I didn't even look at the uh, look at the pricing. Um, but and I thought, up... uh, sorry to interrupt, um, but I was thinking to myself, how can they compete with Alamator? You know, you know, you can literally. Right. Just, uh, right. You know, why would you use Doodal when you could just put up WordPress, Alamator, and off you go? You know? uh, right. Yes, I don't know, but th- this ar- other article, um, which is actually from from May, and and I'm I'm about to crack up here because, so on the website planet, uh, Duda versus uh, WordPress, uh, you know, comparison review, I just got a big pop up ad for Wix. <laughs> um, you know, these people know how to buy their ads. Uh, and, you know, it seems more or less a, a balanced uh, analysis. But, uh, you know, it is a comparison uh, to WordPress.com. And it's quite clear that it's a comparison to WordPress.com because it's in the first sentence. Uh, and so... Well, that's a clue, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it is. I mean, you know, uh, it, it, it's uh, Duda versus WordPress.com comparison. Um, and there well, are a few places it's where... A bit, it's generous, it, isn't it? It's uh, a little bit like I say, but um, what do you reckon, John? Um, how, how can I compete with, like, you just you just ram up a a version of WordPress and you put Alamator free or you buy a Alamator Pro for... Yeah. Free. Well, the, you go, the, the, you? of course, the, first the you need hosting. For, yeah, well, the thing that you're forgetting is you're saying just, but we do this every day. Yeah, that's true. And most of the, mo- I'll tell you, I have a large number of clients that their first site is Wix mm. with something that they did themselves and it's garbage. But we go in there and we make something better on WordPress. Um, Duda, I, I, I see a lot of people who are designers saying this is like, you know, very cool. Yeah, I haven't used it. I haven't run into like a lot of competitor uh, sites for any clients that are on Duda. So it might still be growing, but at least from this unbiased article, not the Duda article, um, it, it at least compared to WordPress.com, it seems yeah. to have some advantages. Yeah, cool, cool, And cool. Uh, uh, one thing I want to say, I don't understand. I, I, I will never understand why automatic didn't just start from scratch with a new product to put on wordpress.com because they would have got there so much quicker if they had just like started from scratch and built something like Wix or Squarespace or Duda because that's what they want to do anyway. Do you understand what I'm saying? What's pretty obvious obvious to me is that Alamator is going to do their own SaaS. Hey, I'm all for it. Let's, they're gonna, they're gonna have to, aren't they? Because yeah, they can clean. I think they should. They should really. What do you reckon, Spencer? Because you know, 
Zippity do da, zippity a. Zippity a. Uh, I don't understand why anybody <laughs> would do these comparisons unless maybe this person is related to Duda because comparing something to WordPress as a page builder is like saying I'm having uh, the Super Bowl at my house. And they're like, really? You have a stadium in your house? No, no, it's like uh, my Super Bowl. It's me and my two kids playing with that little electric football game. It's the Super Bowl. You know, it's not the same thing as the Super Bowl. So sort of comparing another page builder to WordPress and then saying like, look, it's easier or harder, sort of ignores the 40% of the internet and the millions of people already using WordPress, right? So I find these things just sort of a waste of time. Well, it's, I mean, you know, the, the, the thing about it, the, the thing that makes this better than some of the comparisons is that at least they are asking the question, better for what? Uh, and that is uh, what's often left out of these uh, things, you know, better for what, better for whom? I mean, you know, if the entire content of your website is five pages and you can recreate it from memory uh, and it doesn't really, you know, matter if you, uh, if you own it and the only thing that you really need your, your website for is like, you know, the equivalent of a yellow pages ad uh, uh, on the web, Wix is fine. Yeah. I amend, I amend my answer, by the way. I amend my answer because when I look at the page, while I'm on the page, pop-ups for Wix and Weebly and everything come up. So I amend my answer because when I read the page, I realize WebsitePlanet.com just has affiliate links to these things. So the right. whole part and so of I, I, just I imagine they're kind of equally supported by, by, you know, all of the different things they can have affiliates to. Uh, but yeah, most, I mean, even, most review sites even, are just a big even, mess of, of I haven't even looked at Weebly. I haven't looked at Weebly in years. And years. Uh, well, no, Gosh. it hasn't gotten any better. It's garbage. Uh, it's garbage. Uh, 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 yeah. I, I feel like people are always asking me like what they should use to build websites. Cause I yeah, they ask me this. And they're like, hey, what should I do? Um, and I know a couple people that use Doodot, and I've like tried to help them out a little bit here and there because like I know about where I don't know, websites so i know how to build any website that's been anything and i don't know kind of like you know people ask me to fix their computers it's just like well that's not really really my uh, core competency but that's um, right you, you, Duda, you do computers can you set my email up yeah um duda has some really cool things from a agency level side like ability to like manage a bunch of people's websites um and all these people have like places in the I need to build a website ecosphere. Um, and I think like what this article kind of got at a little bit is that if you want to do anything outside of the box remotely, like you have to do something in WordPress because it gives you the flexibility or more flexibility to do that. You take it off a of .com and you have infinite flexibility. Duda is great if you have like, if you're willing to conform your design or your style to the things that Duda will allow you to do. Um, and there's a certain amount of where will my, how will my content fit inside of the architecture of Duda or inside the architecture of Squarespace or inside the architecture of Wix, um, where WordPress will allow you to say, I want X, Y, or Z, and I will make WordPress fit X, Y, or Z, um, which takes a little bit more effort and a little more work. And that's usually how I try to like describe those two things um, between, so people can kind of make their choices. Like, do you want to have the control, but it'll take a little bit more work, or do you want something that's easier, but like you lose some of that control and some of that flexibility. Yeah. And that seems to vary a lot client to client. You know, you have the clients who want to like tinker with every teensy aspect of the design uh, on, on every page. And, uh, you know, you're kind of tearing your hair out. Um, uh, uh, and, you know, you have the clients who have almost no aesthetic sense at all. And it's just like, I want to put this text up there. Uh, you know, I, I don't care. Um, and everybody uh, on the spectrum in between. Yeah, I think that's well put. Well, let's go on to our recommendations of the week. And mine is a film. Yes, it's a film. It's The Man with the Iron Heart. It's about Reinhard Henrik, um, the butcher of Prague. Uh, um, to say one of the most notorious Nazi monsters um, of the Second World War, exterminated, fat, personally killed hundreds of men, women and children, and unfortunately was made controller of Prague 
and continued with his war crimes, thought he was untouchable, murdered, assassinated by some Czechoslovakian commandos that their level of bravery, um, I cannot understand when, how some people can be so brave, paid for their bravery with their lives and the women and other men that supported them in the assassination paid for, for their patriotism of Czechoslovakia with their lives. But they struck out at evil and killed that bastard. It's a great film, and it's a great film about true courage and belief in your country. So, Spencer... Have you got something you want to recommend to the listeners? Well, I, I'm a big fan of World War II history, and I remember him. He was cocky enough. He rode around in a convertible. Oh, he thought he was untouchable, didn't he? Yeah. They got him in a convertible. First guy failed. Second guy did it. But, yeah, it was tough. Okay, so the, I, I gotta, I'm going to bring it down to a lighter mood because that is pretty heavy. But um, uh, good news is douchebaggery is back. And Never, I think Otto. I don't think he's ever left us, is it? So Otto in the WordPress world, Otto is not retired apparently. Oh, is he? We missed him. So, I just got news in on my private newswire from the themes track WordPress, where the the theme um, approval team has now. I can't say the word I was going to say, but slapped Astra, my pal <laughs> Sujay, in the face with a five week suspension. Are you of, but the Ast- of the Astra theme. Oh, God. What for? For allegedly allowing affiliate links in the theme. But Sujay wrote a letter in that it's all in open comments. Like, wait, like, we didn't violate it. There's no affiliate links. It's a filter that other developers can use to da da da. But it doesn't matter. Five weeks. Off with their heads, typical WordPress.org. The number one theme in the repository right now with a million dollars. We've got a story for next week, have we? Suspended for five weeks by a nameless, faceless WordPress.org hack who is probably Otto wearing a mask. Go read the notes for serious bathroom pleasure. In the meantime, everybody who is everybody who's using Astra as the core has to sit on no updates for five weeks as a punishment. So... Punish the users for whatever this ultimate purpose. Like classic WordPress.org, uh, run amok. So, so that's my So developers could put affiliates in links inside of the theme for their clients to use? If, if, if you scroll down, you read the note, it's kind of vague, but they complain about affiliate links and blah, blah, blah. Like, again, nameless, faceless. TRT Messenger is the person who's writing this. It looks like a bot. And then Sujay writes... I think there's a misunderstanding as we do not add affiliate links ourselves at all. We take a pride in having absolutely clean UI and interface, which I agree with, without obstructive advertising, spammy links or banners. I totally agree with that. We admit, however, that we use filters available in third party plugins where we only pass our referral code. But at the same time, we do not add any affiliate links or whatsoever as per the requirement. We're not sure if using the referral filter is against the requirement, but if it is, we're happy to remove it immediately and submit a new version. The suspension for five weeks is kind of harsh considering we don't add any advertising and we only blah, 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 blah. The suspension for I, five I weeks. I think Sujay has managed to be quite civilized in the circumstances. Yes. He he, oh, he's very tactful. He's a, he's a, he's a lovely guy. Always, I have, I have never had a problem with Sujay. Uh, the suspension for five weeks would mean over 1 million users would not be able to update the theme or our existing users install it on a new website. Considering our clean track record, blah, 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 I kindly request reconsider the suspension. And it's just like <laughs> crickets. And that's it. You know, nothing. That's three hours ago. It's an ongoing drama. But just the fact that this would exist is so exemplary of how nobody is at the controls. I mean, seriously. Number one theme in the repository, suspended. Yeah, it's just, just madness, isn't it? It's just absolutely bonkers, isn't it? Um, Sally, do you want to recommend? Uh, yes, nothing so exciting uh, or, or, or dramatic, but uh, and not, not even a new tool, but this came up in a, a discussion where people were wanting to know about uh, getting color palettes out of uh, websites. And if you are not familiar with it and you sometimes need to do this kind of thing, stylifyme.com. 
uh, just put in a URL and it will pull out all of the colors uh, and fonts and, and so on so that you're not like kind of looking at them one at a time in, in, the, uh, uh, in the inspector. And this can be helpful if you need to match something or uh, yeah, it's fantastic. But also, uh, you brought to mind that Animator brought out uh, update, and it's going to come probably in September for the free and for the paid. And it, it's their theme builder. They've really, which was a bit um, naff, but they've really put it on steroids. And it's going to it's um, and global color changes and font changes. It's really looks slick and um they've got some out they've got some pre um videos of the new um template builder for animator free and it looks very impressive very impressive um stephen got anything you want to recommend to the listeners and viewers oh yeah i'm gonna recommend a book uh where the crawdads sing uh, i think it was on the new york Times bestseller a while back ago uh, but I started listening to the book, and if you're looking for a beautifully written book about nature with kind of a murder mystery going on, highly recommend. Yeah, put all your recommendations into chat panel. And John, have you got anything you want to recommend to the listeners and viewers? Yeah, this is a uh, article from Databox. Uh, some tips for improving the search position of key pages. You'll find a couple good tips in there. Just all like right. I think we've had a good show. Um, Spencer, how can people find out more about you and what you're up to? Uh, you can find me at launchflows.com if you're interested in doing custom checkout experiences with WordPress, WooCommerce, uh, Elementor. Or you can find me when you get your free call from your great sponsor at WP Fusion because I help everybody over there with their onboarding calls for free. So look forward to hearing from some of you guys. Yeah, it's a great product from a great developer that has consistently supported the WP Tonic show. And I really appreciate Jake's um, support and that and his team. Sally, um, how can people find out more about you and what you're up to? All right. Uh, you can find me at WPFangirl.com or I am at Sally Getch on Twitter and on uh, Instagram where you will mostly find my garden and my cat. Um, Stephen, how can people find out more about you, your company, and what you're up to? Yeah, you can find out more about us at zipfish.io. We really focus on, like we were talking about earlier, those three things that make hosting amazing, like fast websites, key, reliability, and then support that doesn't just say, hey, go talk to the person that developed your plugin. <laughs> Always useful, isn't it? Uh, um, John, John, look, John, have you got any, uh, how can people find out more about you and what you're up to? Yeah, you can find me at my website, which is lockdownseo.com. Also go to YouTube, search Lockdown SEO or John Lock SEO, and subscribe uh, to my channel, posting about, uh, cut it back, We're only posting about three days a week, but if you have SEO questions, um, I got answers. So. That's great. And I just want to say, panel, especially the regulars that you know, almost turn up every week, I really appreciate you coming on the show, panel. It's, um, I do enjoy the, the, um, the panel show most weeks, and I really appreciate your support. Um, we're going to end it now, folks. We'll see you next week. See you soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.